Welcome everyone to the December 17th select board meeting. Uh, this meeting is called to order at 6.30 p.m. And this is the final meeting of 2012 for the select board. So um, before we get started, um, I would like to note, we don't have any public comment here tonight. I'd like to note uh, under topics the chair did not reasonably anticipate. Um, since we last met was perhaps the most unanticipated thing that could possibly happen, which was that horrible tragedy in Connecticut on uh, Friday. And so I want the community to know that the select board wanted to reach out to the community of Newtown on the community of Amherst's behalf. So we have written a letter to the folks in Newtown, um, as I said, on behalf of Amherst to express um, our townwide condolences. So uh, I'd like to just take a moment to read that letter that will go in the mail tomorrow to Newtown. It says to Miss Patricia Lodra and members of the Board of Selectmen on behalf of the community of Newtown. On behalf of the community of Amherst, Massachusetts, we, the Amherst Select Board, offer our deepest sympathies for the heartbreaking tragedy that has befallen your town. Please know that the people of Amherst weep and grieve with you. We honor you with prayers, with vigils, with acts of kindness, and with efforts to prevent future gun violence and to improve resources for treating mental illness. We salute the brave men and women of your emergency responder forces for their courageous acts and wish them solace for all that they have had to endure. We ache for the teachers, administrators, staff, and families of your school system. There are no words. We recognize and appreciate how much your own leadership means to your community right now, and we wish you great strength in that. And we hold all of the residents of Newtown in our hearts. Please know that 100 miles away, Amherst stands strong with Newtown. Sincerely, the Amherst Select Board. So, thank you. I hope that we have captured uh, Amherst's sentiments with that. There's been so much conversation in the last couple of days among people who just, they care so much. They, uh, they relate so much to what these folks are experiencing. It, it feels almost as raw to us as it does to them and uh, so since people are looking for ways to to help and express <coughs> that caring um, thought that it would be helpful to really directly express that caring um, from from our community to theirs so uh, select board members make sure we don't leave this meeting tonight without signing that letter okay thank you very much all right other items we have this evening um, we'll do a couple of untimed items before we get to our time scheduled items. We have the renewal of annual licenses. This should essentially complete or more or less complete our renewals for 2013. We did the liquor licenses at the last meeting and we have essentially everything else at this meeting. Ms. Stein, would you like to make that motion? I move that the select board <coughs> approve the renewals for licenses as presented on list entitled, quote, 2013 license renewals, end quote, dated December 17th, 2012, subject to receipt of documentation noted as pending for the calendar year beginning January 1, 2013 through December 31st, 2013. Second. Further discussion. Ms. Brewer. If I could just ask a question, the, um, this version that was in our packet and this version that's on our desk, the only difference I see is that this one includes the comments um, field as well, and I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything else. That's correct. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Additional further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That was unanimous. Okay, next up we have, um, all right. Let's see, we'll do the we'll do the Emancipation Proclamation thing. We weren't sure if other folks might show up to speak to that, but we do have Deb Radway here, who is uh, our Human Resources and Human Rights Director and who is staff liaison to the Human Rights Commission, and she's going to tell us about the uh, town's plans for the anniversary of the Emancipation mm. Proclamation. Good evening, thank you for having me back. Uh, we have great plans for 
January 1st um, in Amherst and throughout the Pioneer Valley and we hope the Commonwealth uh, at 2 p.m. in Amherst and hopefully throughout the Pioneer Valley and throughout the Commonwealth there will be a ringing of the bells, church bells, community bells, town bells, personal bells, uh, all kinds of bells. If I, I watched uh, Lincoln Saturday night, and you know, halfway through the the film, there's Abraham Lincoln standing in his office waiting for the vote on the Emancipation Proclamation. And how did he find out about it? The church bells throughout the Capitol started ringing. And uh, that was a great reminder uh, that the ringing of the bells is very symbolic of uh, the Emancipation Proclamation and the free freeing of, of uh, slaves. In, here in Amherst, the Human Rights Commission is inviting everybody to join them at two o'clock here on the Town Common uh, for a vigil that will include the reading of the proclamation uh, <coughs> Emancipation Proclamation. We have these great commemorative posters that we're hoping uh, to get multiple copies of and distribute them throughout town because we're also encouraging the business community uh, to, to pause at <coughs> 2 o'clock and to stand outside their business and ring a bell. Uh, we will have Michelle Brooks, our local renowned uh, singer, uh, recently, most recently performed on The Voice. She will be uh, participating in this event singing uh, Stevie Wonder's Happy Birthday to You uh, and uh, we're just gonna gather together and, and remember this event and everything that it stands for. We're inviting the community but if people can't come to the common we're encouraging them to pause wherever they may be and ring a bell. Terrific, thank you. And uh, we uh, ask the, you the, to, uh, sorry, also to proclaim January 1st, 2013 as Emancipation Proclamation Day in Amherst. Yes, and there's information about this on the website for folks who are not taking notes necessarily right now? There is. Very good. Um, let's see, would someone like to read the proclamation that we have with us tonight? We have time. Sometimes we don't, but tonight we have time for this. Yes, I would. Mr. Hayden. <laughs> are you, are you going to find it, Diane? No, I can't find it, but it's in here, but you Somewhere go ahead. Somewhere in there. You go. Whereas in our country, our country is made up of people from every nation on earth who are declared equal, not only in freedom, but also in justice, both of which are essential for a healthy human civilization. And whereas our nation was conceived on July 4th, 1776, with the Declaration of Independence, the classic statement being, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that are among, uh, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and whereas at 2 p.m. on New Year's Day, January 1st, 1863, using his war powers as president, Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, providing that all persons held as slaves within any state or designated a part of a state shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. The Emancipation Proclamation made the permanent abolition of slavery a union war <clears throat> aim and provided the legal framework for the emancipation of nearly all four million slaves as the Union armies advanced. Hearing of the proclamation, many slaves escaped to Union lines as the Army units moved south and, whereas our nation became totally free only with the ratification of the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which officially outlaws slavery. It was passed by the Senate and the House and adopted on December 6, 1865. Whereas this Emancipation Proclamation announced 150 years ago inspired a citizen-led process that eventually promulgated the promise of our Declaration of Independence. That, pro that process continues today as we continue to commit to make justice a reality in all civil rights issues from gender to economics that follow slavery from 1865. Now, therefore, the select board of the town of Amherst do hereby proclaim January 1st, 2013 as Emancipation Proclamation Day in Amherst to be celebrated at 2 p.m. by vigorous ringing of bells throughout the community and a gathering on the town common led by the Human Rights Commission. 
Thank you very much. And let's see, Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion sure. thus proclaiming? I move that the select board proclaim January 1st, 2013 as Emancipation Proclamation Day in Amherst to be celebrated at 2 p.m. by vigorous ringing of bells throughout the community and a gathering on the town common led by the Human Rights Commission. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you for you. helping put that together and that should be really a lovely event. I love the idea of the bells, and uh, I will have to see Lincoln before that so that I can <laughs> catch that moment. It does put it in context. That's wonderful. <laughs> I'm glad to know that. Okay, let's see. A couple more things before we get to 645 item. What can we do quick? We can do some minutes. Okay. Minutes. 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 Ms. Stein. I have read the minutes, and I had two very minor points, which I'll hand to you. Uh, Mr. Musanti, I can therefore move that we accept them. So I move that the select board approve the minutes of January 7, 2012, September 10, 2012, and September 24, 2012, as amended. Second. Further discussion? So you had just a couple of minor points. You Very said. minor points. I thought that... Um, when we talked about a contract for the town manager, it should mention his name, <laughs> or at least that he was for the town Oops. manager, you know. Um, and one was a plural that I thought should be saying. Very good. Did anybody else have any issues with any of those minutes? Okay. I was going to just mention those exact same things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and all in favor, say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Thank you. And we have one taxi license. Okay. I move that the select board approve a new taxi slash chauffeur license for Helen Gilday of Florence MA for Celebrity Cab Company for the calendar year 2012. Yep. Okay. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Okay. That takes care of the ones that we can do quickly. So uh, does anybody have any announcements that they want to make? Because we have three minutes to kill before our 645 item. Ms. Stein. The Winter Common Market is up and running and just a marvelous place. It is so community oriented. Why well, I even met your father there. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, it's really a terrific gathering. Um, somehow it's very spirited. There's music. There's all kinds of crafts and goodies and fresh produce and it's just really uh, a delightful way to start your Sunday morning. It runs from 10 to 2 and it's at the middle school. Thank you. Good thing to remind folks of. Anything else people would like to mention? Mr. Wald. Since we have Deb here, I want to thank her and the Human Rights Commission for their vigil last week, which the chair and I attended at the reading of the Declaration of uh, International Declaration of Human Rights. And it was Always a moving occasion. Thank you. Yes, that was the first time I'd had the opportunity to attend that event, and that was really, really lovely. And so then I went home and I read up about it on Wikipedia and uh, and <laughs> learned a great deal. And uh, I think that there's the potential to bring the whole town out for that, actually. And uh, I think that we should start earlier promoting that. I can imagine that being a very, very big deal in Amherst, as opposed to, there, there are probably a dozen or so folks. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a nice turnout, but um, I think that if, uh, if more people knew about it and knew the significance of it, I would think we would get crowds. So uh, I've, I've marked my master select board calendar for next year to, uh, to, to really play that up because uh, that was really very moving. Thank you for bringing that up. Anyone else have announcements? Comments. <coughs> All right, then, as we like to see here at Select Board, it is 644, which is the same as 645. So we have Ms. Radway here for our 645 item, which is a uh, an audit of the town's human resources, uh, resources essentially, and uh, she's going to tell us about that. So. And uh, I'll also mention for folks, because this kills just another moment, is uh, that uh, the information she's talking about is in our packet online for folks who are following along at home all yours thank you well when John asked me to conduct the assessment of human resources that's included in his performance goals for fiscal 13 I was I was pretty eager to take on uh, the task I was brand new 
and had a lot of my own ideas. John had his ideas. But what was really most important is what's actually happening. And for that, we needed the input from town staff, uh, which they've been eager to do. I proposed conducting the human resources audit as a means to provide the baseline data in which to develop a plan for the next couple of years for human resources in the town. Um, let me just take a minute to explain what a human resources audit is. The primary objective of a human resources audit is to take a, an objective <coughs> look at the, all of the town's human resources policies and practices and evaluate whether or not they are adequate, legal, or effective and then to use the information gathered to decide what policies or practices need to be created, updated, revised, deleted, or improved. Um, a second objective for me was and is to learn about what our departments do and how they generally function so that a plan can be developed for the stable, progressive, organization of the human resources function in the town of Amherst. So what I uh, did was invite every town department head uh, to meet with me for, and each session lasted individually for one and a half to two hours with each department head. Uh, and I invited them to determine who I should meet with and more than a few of them brought additional staff along. And I let them know in advance what I'd be asking so they had time to think about what they wanted to say, to consult with others, and, and to respond. <clears throat> so I sat down with each department head in the town of Amherst, and I actually also sat down with uh, Kathy Mazur at the schools. And the topics that I covered included the overall quality of HR communications to town staff and their assessment of same, uh, an assessment of each department's morale, whether they had any issues in, from the personnel procedures man that they would like to see addressed in the personnel procedures manual or in any of the union contracts that they um, administered, the status of current mandatory training in each department, the conflict of interest training, sexual harassment training that we, that we need to do, other training and professional development needs that they wanted to pursue, opportunities for cross-training with other departments or within their departments, to, to identify what opportunities might exist, um, to identify what opportunities for offering or taking advantage of our department functions provided regionally with other communities or other public organizations, if there were any opportunities that they saw for um, regional, regionalizing any of our functions. Uh, to identify in each department who is the best person or persons to, to provide training to others about that department's functions, or if we're to do a train the trainer function, who are the, pe who are the people best communicating ideas and, and um, strategies? <coughs> I asked each of them about the status of their performance reviews for each department and what they thought of the town's or their department's performance review process. I asked them if they had, if their department had any pending disciplinary <coughs> issues or grievances, and to describe them if they did. I asked them to discuss what their staffing, staffing vacancies are and whether or not they had any critical staffing issues that needed addressing. I asked them to assess the benefits package, the overall benefits package offered by the town. I asked them to tell me what they thought of the town's current recruiting process and how it's handled by each department. 
and what the HR department's role in recruiting is. I asked them to assess their current hiring and new employee orientation processes and exit processes. How does somebody leave town employment? And then the treasure trove of valuable information is, have I missed anything that you'd like to talk about? Uh, and, and I invited them to talk to me about any items of concern. <coughs> So I got a lot of information, a lot of earfuls. Uh, people didn't hold back, and for that I am very, very, very grateful. And on the second page where I have the uh, human resources audit and talking points is really a synthesis of my thoughts, John's thoughts, and town staff thoughts. And, the f and it's really the first steps towards what I think we need to achieve in human resources in the next two years. Um, I can talk about this for hours, and I know I have 10 minutes or so, so just give me the hook when you need to, okay? <laughs> uh, if I could start with what I found out are the really positive and success story attributes of, of what folks <coughs> think about human resources in Amherst. Um, you, have a really, you have a motivated and forward-thinking town staff across the board. Uh, there's good overall morale, very few grievances, disciplinary actions throughout town. You have settled contracts and collegial relations with your employee groups. There's a valued sal salary and benefits package, which is a good recruiting mechanism. People want to work here. Our wages are competitive without being best in class and coupled with a really strong benefits package, makes the town of Amherst a clear employer of choice in Western Massachusetts. And that is something to be very, very proud of. The town has robust HRIS IT capabilities in the Munis package that the town owns that hasn't even, haven't tipped the iceberg yet on, on what is capable, what we, what we are capable of achieving through that package um, if we devote the resources and time to it. And I can talk a little bit more about that later. We have pockets of exemplary professional development and training. Uh, the resources that we do spend in departments like police, fire, and IT, uh, <coughs> we reap the benefits of that. And departments across the board are eager for more training and learning. Uh, and, and the last positive that I can share with you is that uh, it was heartening to know that HR is, is wanted and valued by the town staff. Um, some of the challenges that I learned about are that there's really a desire for more communication from HR uh, about what's going on in town and through HR with the town manager to celebrate some of more of our accomplishments, let people know what we're doing, and to do it in a more organized fashion. There was widespread desire for the non-union compensation plan to be reviewed. There are a number of human resources policies that need a collaborator collaborative review and updating. Um, for example, the affirmative action plan, our drug and alcohol workplace policy, and our vehicle policy, and our safety plan. There's been a lack of coordinated and sustained training and professional development throughout the town. As I said before, we have pockets of, of superiority, of real excellence, and we can see the benefits of it, but it's not sustained throughout the community. Um, the Munis HR modules uh, that are out there are dense, complex, and underutilized. We need to re-energize employee safety committees and our focus on safety altogether. 
HR staff roles need to be clarified. Um, there's not a big HR staff, but I think we could benefit by clarifying our roles. And there's a, been a large pent up need for HR strategic assistance um, that has been requiring me to play a lot of catch up. So those are the challenges. And all of those success stories and challenges lead to opportunity. Um, and w this is really what I'd like to focus my, my attention on in the next year, mm -hmm. year and a half, and tell you what I'm gonna do to address um, the positives and the, and the challenges um, with John's support. And the, and the first is to put together some cross-functional work teams to standardize, to create those standardized HR, standardized HR procedures for performance evaluation, hiring, orientation, and exit. And I've got lots of volunteers um, from town staff already to work on those. So that's gonna be fun and um, effective and shouldn't take too, too long. I have collaborated with UMass Workplace Learning and Development and the Massachusetts Municipal Personnel Association to host a supervisor and leadership training program at UMass, excuse me, at our wastewater treatment plant this spring. Uh, and we will be guaranteed at least a dozen slots in that program that will be offered uh, regionally. And I'm hoping that that will be the first step in a system, systematic offering of leadership training because I believe strongly that, that building from within will, will uh, staff our departments most strongly. And additionally, labor management and workplace education at UMass would like to work with some line staff on basic computer training and English writing skills. Uh, so that can be another layer of training that we offer in addition to build people who can be supervisors. This winter we're gonna be implementing MUNIS modules for employee self-service um, that will help people be able to log <coughs> in on MUNIS themselves, update their personal information, uh, update their tax information, their beneficiaries and, and, the, and such, and to look at their time off requests. And we've got a working group to evaluate the applicability of MUNIS, the staffing and the applicant tracking and recruitment module, uh, which will require a capital appropriation by town meeting. But if we uh, are successful in that, it will streamline how people apply through our website to the town of Amherst and uh, build in the whole interviewing process and communications and tracking it for EEO, equal opportunity reporting and such. And uh, it'll be also help to create a staffing plan for the town of Amherst, which I think is another one of, of John's goals because we'll use position control, which is a way of saying we know how many labor truck drivers we have we, and budget and <coughs> need to stay within and how many patrol officers and how many administrative assistants across departments will really be able to get a handle on what our plan is and how to stay within budget and not go over budget and what, and what we want for staffing. Um, in my FY14 budget, I'm also proposing to redefine HR staff roles to focus on uh, HR general and strategic management with me, benefits and safety, and then an HR administrative assistant. Um, that's in process and with in, under John's consideration. Uh, finally, uh, a plan to a assess and address common training needs throughout the organization. Um, that's something I'd like to, to do in the next year. And then to work with John to create some simple communications initiatives uh, to celebrate staff accomplishments and um, get the word out 
a little bit better about what we're doing to market ourselves to the community. Those are some of the things I'm working on for Thank the next you. year. Th that's a great report, and we'll have time for a couple of questions from select board members. Um, this has been a goal that's been important to the select board for a number of years now, and uh, I, I think um, when we talk about the town's budget and we talk about that staff, I mean, basically what the town pays for is people to be expert in their areas to carry out the programs and services that this community values. And mm -hmm. so to, to assess our human resources needs and capabilities for those staff has just been critically important. And this is, uh, this sounds incredibly positive <coughs> and I'm sure it was very well received by the employees. So uh, thank you, thank you. That's very comprehensive and incredibly fascinating. And we could probably talk about it for two hours, but okay. we won't. So questions or comments from select board members. Ms. Stein. As you said, we've been waiting for this and it's just wonderful to see it materialized and to realize how much staff had input into it. So I think that's wonderful and I thank you for it. Mr. Hayden. Yeah, I, I, yes, we have been talking about this for a long time and it's great to, to see the fruits of, well, the request <coughs> and your labor. Um, as I was reading this, um, I was struck by a thought which I, I really hadn't, um, hadn't pursued in our earlier discussions and that <coughs> is the role that we may end up playing um, in a number of these things and I just wanna sort of sort of encourage my colleagues to, you know, to figure out what that is and support it. And, I, and the, the one that's the easiest to, um, to imagine because we already do it to a, a very minor extent is the, the simple communications initiative to celebrate staff accomplishments. We do that for police officers and, and firefighters um, and fire officers. So, you know, thinking, right. hey, maybe there's more that we could be doing there because that, that, I feel that's valuable. It makes me feel good and it does expose um, you know, the people who are doing good work for us to the people for whom they're doing those good work. Thank you. That's a good point. And, and so for, for folks who might not uh, understand what Mr. Hayden means, um, <laughs> when, uh, when officers uh, in the police and fire departments get promoted, they come in here and do a ceremonial swearing in, even though they've done their real swearing in with the town clerk's office. Um, I think select board meetings are actually an incredibly valuable way of getting some of that information out to the public. And I know that we do it, and Mr. Musanti does it as well during the meeting, talking about, you know, after the snowstorm uh, last year, what an incredible job the DPW did with... Uh, with all of the management of that or you know what what an amazing job the town clerk's office did after the uh, the uh, presidential elections this year and, and things like that um, but uh, but if we all have a greater awareness of trying to keep those things in mind and also you know mr. Musanti and I as we're talking about his town managers report uh, for each meeting we can be kind of prompting each other on that too because um because this is one this is one of many venues that that information needs to get out and this is the venue that gets directly to the community so that the community understands just what an incredible job all of these staff folks are doing on their behalf every day so I appreciate that point very much mr. Wald yeah, just to put it in context again we as the memo explains doing an audit of human resources is one of the town manager performance goals, but of course we couldn't ask them to do it without the proper resources, no pun intended. So uh, <laughs> this is excellent because now you, we really have the, the tools in place to do this. And it's, it's, a, it's a great report. I think it also makes clear how much of a backlog of work there was to be done. So we know you're not just stepping into a smoothly functioning system here. You've got a lot to re re reconfigure and make work as you see fit. And we appreciate that. Ms. Brewer. In terms of relationships with the public, one of the um, things I want to follow up on too is, you know, we've talked about in, in other parts of town is recognizing volunteers, and we want to make sure we do a better job of that. We also want to recognize our staff every day, whether it's a big project like the snow removal or a particular election or some particular idea that somebody's come up with. I'm assuming that the town manager, and we encourage the town manager to um, reward that sort of thing with some public recognition within that town hall, but it's always really great to be able to share with the community so and so came up with this new process of doing something and now people don't have to spend their time doing this other thing and um, the more we can do that particularly in these budget times seems really important one other um, I'm not going to ask you to answer the question per se at this point but as you go forward <coughs> with um, talking about clarifying roles etc one of the things I think that the public also is really interested in understanding is the difference between human resources and human rights because we have combined those positions for several years now in terms of 
what that actually means. And so I think a lot of us can understand because of our regular work a day world what we think human resources means. But the way that that interconnects with the human rights work I think is really important for people to understand. And one example of that is the, tr um, the ADA transition plan. I know that um, the DAAC committee is you know, very familiar with those details, but outside of them, I don't think very many people have any concept as to, you know, it might be one thing to talk about access for employees, you know, in a particular situation, but to understand what our town's responsibility is associated with those things. So, like you said, lots to do, but stuff we look forward to seeing more about. So thank you. Other questions or comments from select board members? Mr. Musanti, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I just want to uh, uh, also, uh, th this is a fundamentally important task um, and uh, um, I would encourage those who haven't read this uh, overview prepared by Ms. Radway that's posted online and for tonight's meeting packet to do so. It really distills down into about three pages. Uh, you know, here's what's working great, here's what some of our biggest challenges are, and here's a handful of most important needs going forward that is the basis for an action plan over the next couple of years. And it really has crystallized helped crystallize for me and others within the organization what, you know, a roadmap going forward. And uh, this really is a long-term effort and will be a marathon, not a sprint, not to use that overused phrase, but I just did. Um, but this uh, really is a roadmap to uh, uh, make our organization that much stronger. And I would reinforce the training pieces there. I think. Deb very accurately described. We have pockets of excellence, but uh, it's uh, there's much more to be done, and uh, I've encouraged Deb to uh, use her you know years of experience and build additional partnerships. And you see that reflected also on the uh, relationships through uh, the HR professional associations as well as the university, which will have a direct benefit to our supervisory and and line staff in the coming year. So I think. It's an excellent report. There's a lot to do, and it's great to have Deb on our team. Indeed. So uh, if you, as you think <laughs> of it, um, can let Mr. Musanti know or let myself know when, when you hit some milestones that you think should be talked about, um, we can do updates on that stuff at these meetings, which is another good way of getting that information out there. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I'll try and keep it on my kind of tickler file to be checking with you for updates, too. The, I'm sure the Munis stuff is really fascinating and how that all develops. Um, I'm sure we would like to hear much about. So thank you. This is a tremendous report and, uh, and really very much appreciated. Mr. Hayden. I'd also like to uh, sort of comment that, that um, I mean, the reason that this was important to, to us, to me, um, <coughs> is that I think it, it demonstrates um, good stewardship to one of our uh, greatest assets, certainly one that we, we put a lot of value in, like 88% of our budget value in it, so this is yep. feeling like the stewardship is is um, maybe a little bit better now. Indeed, I mean it's all about the employees, you know, the people who are doing the job of town business every day on behalf of the community. It's right. it's all about that. So um so trying to serve them as best we can, um, making sure that they have the infrastructure and the support and the resources that they need to do their job is is critically important and this is really just a, a tremendous framework for for helping to support that so again thank you very much thank you for inviting me in all right our seven o'clock item we appreciate your patience folks if you could come forward this is a public hearing for a liquor license alteration of premises and this is for mission cantina at four 85 West Street, and I'm calling this public hearing to order at 7.09. So you folks can introduce yourselves. We have the very big packet of information uh, as part of the Select Board's web packet, so folks who are following along at home can check that out as well. And uh, have uh, some additional housekeeping. Very well. So these are the return receipts from oh, the yeah. to the abutters. Great, thank you. Um, I'm an attorney here in town representing Sam Cohan, who's the 
manager and the, the main owner of Mission Cantina in, in South Amherst. Um, actually, several months back, we went through the process of obtaining a special permit for the expansion of the restaurant. He's essentially doubled it in size. And we're here tonight to ask that the liquor license be approved. Um, the expansion of the restaurant uh, be, be approved as far as the liquor license capacity goes. And, and the packet is here if you have any questions. Um, I guess feel free to ask. Okay, so folks at home know uh, we talk about this a lot. There are certain elements of the liquor license that are just incredibly specific and any change to them whatsoever <clears throat> needs to come back before us for <coughs> approval. Um, and among those is exactly the footprint for which the license is covering and by altering the premises, by, by indeed uh, expanding the restaurant, almost doubling its size, um, that has significantly altered the premises. So, uh, so uh, th that uh, is needs to come before us for approval. Um, I will note, um, as uh, Attorney Bodine noted, that this did go to ZBA for the whole, um, um, what do you call it, change to their- permit? Special permit. Yeah, the special permit, the alteration or whatever of their special permit. Um, so that dealt with all of the issues like parking and you know all of the technicalities of, of how to make this thing work and how to um, make sure it, it fits in the area and, and the neighbors are protected and blah, blah, blah. So the only thing before us, all of those, all of those very minute details have been worked out. The only thing before us, and I will also note, so that means they are allowed to expand the restaurant. The only question tonight is whether they are also allowed to serve alcohol within that expanded area of the restaurant. So just to focus us. So uh, do select board members have any questions for Attorney Bodine or Mr. Cohan? Mr. Hayden. Maybe not a, not a question so much as a comment that um, <coughs> I really kind of enjoy um, the prospect of, of, of um, um, considering this since it is uh, demonstrating a very successful business and, and uh, very one where it's pleasant to spend some time. Right? Other questions or comments? It's a successful Aaron means that you often can't get in. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll actually get to eat there now. Won't that be nice? Oh, it's always worth the wait, <laughs> I assure you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Questions or comments related to the license? Mr. Hayton. Now, um, you're not going to change the menu or the service at all. It's just going to get the... The, the menu will expand um, in size by a few dishes. We're going to add a few more things to it. Not the liquor menu, but the, the actual um, appetizers will get a little bit bigger. We're running two kitchens now, which is very much helpful to us to get the process more, you know, to, to get everything out faster. So we're going to have a little more room to, to play with some new things, which is pretty exciting. So, And you're going to be serving lunch. Yes. That's very yes. exciting. Lunch. Great. And late, late night too, actually. Nice. So. Yes. All right. Anyone from the public like to comment? <laughs> There's no one here from the public. All right, then I will entertain a motion to close the public hearing at 7.13. I so move. Second. Further discussion on closing the public hearing. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Time to deliberate. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, this really is a technicality. that They already have the special permit to expand the area. This is really just about expanding their liquor sales. Everybody loves Mission Cantina. Yeah. It's all good. Win-win. Mr. Hayden. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 if it was a place that was misbehaving or had problems or, or I didn't enjoy so much, I <clears throat> think the comments would be filled up with all kinds of stuff. The comments, I think, are, you know, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to it. And, and uh, you know. Indeed. Yeah. All right. Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? I move that the select board approve the application of MGBI. <laughs> LLC doing business as Mission Cantina, ABCC license number 00240011, 485 West Street, Amherst, MA, relative to alteration of license premises to include expansion into adjacent space, increasing total occupancy to no more than 49 persons, including employees with hours of dine-in service from 11 a.m. to 1 a.m. seven days a week in accordance with special permit FY 2012-00024 to modify FY 2011-00016 and an approved floor plan dated June 7, 2012, Sam Cochin, manager. 
Second. Further discussion, Mr. Hayden. Are all those numbers right? I don't it, know. They look like it, but I, I mean, I, I just, just don't Did want I something to go right wrong. I get them right in reading them. That. Yes. Another yeah, they're referenced from the uh, uh, application and the uh, permits themselves. So all those numbers right? That's what they're... the only <laughs> number that wasn't was, is MGB one, not MGBI. Right. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry about Thank you. that. All right, further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Congratulations. Thank you very much. When is this all going to be opening and ready? Thank you. Well, when is it going to be ready? Um, last April? Uh, um, <laughs> yes, pretty soon. This is gonna, we're waiting on this to get everything done so we can open up and, and have a kind of a grand opening and have everything intact. So probably mid-January, I would think. Terrific. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Thank you, guys. Thank you for coming in. Appreciate Thank you. It. All right. Next up we have... Okay, we made this a timed item in case this was something that people were going to um, <clears throat> want to come in and speak to. This is a proposed amendment to the over the street banner permit regulations. The, uh, this is for the banner on South Pleasant Street. It is, as far as I know, the only over the street banner that we have in town. Um, and we had a uh, uh, suggestion from a <coughs> citizen recently about how this might be improved, how the regulations might be improved, and so those uh, those suggestions were incorporated into the regulations. And Mr. Musanti, would you like to tell us more uh, about that? Yes. Uh, for many years, we've had a policy that allowed uh, groups to uh, uh, have the town DPW hoist a promotional banner across South Pleasant Street for one week. In one, one week only, we were approached about whether we would be open to, uh, on a space available basis, allow a group to have the banner up for more than one consecutive week. And so there was a suggestion made about how we might amend that, and that's what's before you tonight. Uh, and the, the practical effect of all this is, look, if there's not a, a competing group that has requested a new banner go up in its place for the following week, and you let us know by, I think, the previous Thursday, uh, you, for a very small fee, you can have your banner up a second or more week on a space available basis. So we thought it was completely workable, worked it out with our DPW and office staff, and we're recommending it. So this doesn't bump anybody. It, That's right. it only is um, leaving up uh, the banner when otherwise it would have been taken down and there would have been nothing in its place. That's right. So uh, yeah, I think it, I think it was a great suggestion. I really appreciated that the town manager's office um, just seized that and, and made the change happen to uh, bring this recommendation to us tonight. Questions or comments about the change? Mr. Wald. Just a, a trivia one because section number two is called content. So I wanted to remind the public that occasionally there are questions about what goes up and why and that we're not regulating or endorsing content. This just states that they're nonprofit or not-for-profit organizations are allowed to use the banner. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Uh, and I will note that uh, this material is also in our packets on the web packet with the uh, highlighted material being the proposed change. Uh, Mr. Hayden, your, um, your name tags are backwards. It's not confusing me because I know who you are, but I'm just noting. Oh, I wonder. I wasn't, I wasn't paying attention. Confused today. You look different tonight. Um, the, the, um, speaking of things looking different, this, this, this. Since the last time I put a banner up, this form is much, much clearer and easier to use. I don't know when that changed, but now that I see it, I, I very appreciate it for that as well. With the rules it, on one side. It's that HR thing. The, the, our, Deb, thank you, Deb. Deborah. Uh, all over this, my assistant. Lots of good things going on on the third floor right now in town hall. <laughs> Other questions or comments? All right, Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? I would. <clears throat> I move that the select board amend the over the street banner permit regulations by replacing <clears throat> section three with the following. <laughs> Applications for banner permits are to be filed with the Department of Public Works. Permits are limited to seven calendar days beginning and ending on Monday of any given week. Should the subsequent week remain unreserved through 3 p.m. on the Thursday of the week a licensee's banner is displayed, the permittee may apply for an additional week by contacting the Department of Public Works no later than the close of business that day. The extension fee must be paid prior to Friday by 3 p.m. of that same week to ensure extension. 
There's a little bit oh, more. Oh, yes, sorry. Paragraph. No more than two extensions may be granted per permit. Any extensions granted will not count toward the two non-consecutive weeks per year for separate dated events. Second. For the discussion, Mr. Wald. Good. Tiny one about the text, since the wording of the, unless I'm, <laughs> we're still confused about oh, who we are. Uh, uh, the motion says replacing section three with the following, but section three is actually much larger. Does that mean that we're striking the final paragraph about holiday Mondays and so forth? I assume that's not the intention, but I could be wrong. No, the only difference on the, on the uh, right. policy itself is what you see in yellow. Right, so we should really reword the motion, shouldn't we? Yeah, we should say by replacing part of section three with the following. Could I suggest? Okay. Um, it seems to me, and I don't know this for sure since we went with the highlighting method, which I appreciate. Um, it, the highlighting method starts with the word should. It does not include the first two sentences, so Correct. I think we're just adding. Mm -hmm. So it's by adding the following to section three. That's what it looks like, right? Oh, uh, it's partially replacing, too. No, it's not, because there, we've been given no indication that any of this is replacing. It, it's additional language, it's not just replacement. Additional. Oh, okay. Right. So these two sentences didn't need to be part of the motion because they right. were already in there. And it starts with the third sentence, should the subsequent work, and that's all just additional information that we didn't have before. So, so I think I think that's right. And I think in the motion itself then replacing the word replacing <laughs> <laughs> with adding to section, section three, three the, the following. following. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. I still second. For the discussion. Thank okay. you, Mr. Wald. <laughs> I keep looking at the yes. name tags, it's gonna drive me crazy. <laughs> now that I've now that Thank I've you. noticed it. I'm, yeah, but it's, okay. Uh, is there still more issues with that? No, it's okay. I, th I think uh, we should leave it as we've got it now. Okay, you're sure you're good with that? Okay, <coughs> and all in favor say aye. 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 aye, that's unanimous. Thank you very much. And then we have a second motion uh, as part of this. I move that the select board set the fee at $60 for each subsequent week extension for banner display granted. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. <clears throat> okay. Banner permit regulations amended. Our next item is a town manager's report, and we start with our first progress report on his FY13 performance goals. And once again, this memo is in the packet on the website. Uh, sure, and thank you. And um, as Ms. Ms. O'Keefe said, uh, we've had a practice the last few years. Uh, provide a progress report uh, uh, sometime, you know, roughly halfway through the fiscal year. And that's the purpose of tonight. And so I've again tried to summarize uh, briefly uh, next to each of the 11 specific performance goals uh, uh, developed by the board this summer and fall uh, for my work and the work of the town. Uh, I wanted to highlight just a few of them. Um, so I'll just go on the key ones. Uh, goal number one, uh, can, which is a recurring goal, but obviously important in this uh, day and age, especially with uh, limited resources, uh, uh, and some would call the new fiscal reality facing this state and this country, uh, developing uh, recommendations for consideration to generate new revenue, reduce expenses, uh, negotiate uh, collective bargaining, uh, economic development, et cetera. Um, on new revenue, I think there's three, three good examples over the last six months or so. Uh, we were de newly designated as a green community by the Commonwealth, which was a really uh, collaborative effort on the part of town staff, uh, our many citizen groups in a partnership with the Commonwealth. Uh, in July, we were designated as a green community and that gives us opportunities to receive and put to good use uh, grant funding for uh, energy efficiency uses and we were awarded a $302,000 grant, our first green communities grant, we think the first of many. And 
We've developed a plan. We are awaiting now the receipt back from the Commonwealth of the signed contract. We've gotten uh, approval from them. We now need the actual signed contract. We'll then uh, place the order through the state uh, bid list for LED streetlights. And you can expect to see LED streetlights installed uh, all over town uh, in the first quarter of 2013. We expect that will save uh, a lot of electricity and save, uh, save us a lot of money. Uh, we have some rough estimates any, uh, somewhere around the $40,000 a year range uh, in, in our first year. Um, so that's one example. Second example, uh, with your support, uh, uh, we have uh, executed an intermunicipal agreement with the town of Pelham to provide assess property assessing services to them. We're able to do that without increasing our staff and piggyback onto our investments we've already made in database and, and our, our professional staff. Uh, that will be new revenue to the town of about 20,000 a year. Uh, we've also been uh, some continuing success on grant funding. Uh, we were awarded a land grant uh, in November for the Ritchie property, which is one of the last unprotected large parcels uh, along the Holyoke Range uh, off of Bay Road. And that was 70% funded by the state, 353,000, and uh, the balance funded by uh, town meetings, strong support for a Community Preservation Act funding. Um, uh, in terms of efficiencies, I've been harping on health insurance, uh, keeping those costs under control. And the biggest initiative this past year, we moved over 200 retired school employees, mostly teachers, uh, after a, a, pr a long process from the state GIC health plans onto the town plans. And in the course of doing that, the vast majority of those retirees will save uh, money between premiums and copays. Uh, and the school system, both regional and the town schools, will save over 100000 a year in premium costs uh, as a result of that. So that's uh, uh, immediate fiscal savings to keep those costs in check. Uh, we're also uh, uh, implementing, uh, we've expanded our online bill pay, so it's easier to pay town bills online. It's also faster and cheaper for our uh, collection staff to process those. Uh, and we're also, you can expect us to be rolling out uh, electronic billing, paperless billing for water and sewer services uh, in the first half of 2013. All those uh, frequent reminders you get from utility companies and others, uh, we want to be that part of the municipal conversation as well and uh, uh, do it that way. Um, strengthening relationships with the university and the colleges, uh, uh, Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods Initiative, Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods Work Group. Uh, UMass is a major player in that uh, in terms of enforcement, uh, student education, student code of conduct, other leadership uh, provided by the uh, university on that. So that's an ongoing effort. Uh, We've reintroduced joint patrols. You can expect to see uh, a more and different types of joint patrols in the spring. Those are being actively worked on with, with very strong collaboration with the UMass Police Department and our chief and, and campus leadership and myself. Um, also, a, uh, later in this fiscal year, the first quarter of 2013 in particular, I've already had some preliminary discussions with the university about uh, uh, discussing and executing a successor agreement to our expiring uh, strategic partnership agreement, which we're in our sixth year on, which governs uh, many of the relationships we have with the university, public safety and water and sewer and ambulance and all those kinds of things. Um, just wanted to highlight that. Um, um, the HR uh, Human Resources Audit, uh, Ms. Radway gave a very comprehensive and uh, thorough report uh, tonight. Uh, that's an active effort, and uh, um, um, so you'll be hearing more about that in the months ahead. 
making great progress there. Um, uh, goal number nine, you also heard about staffing plan. All of that is a precursor to a more detailed plan. You'll have specific staffing recommendations both uh, for FY14 and longer term in the budget document, but as we've talked about uh, in the evaluation process and subsequent, uh, having a standalone uh, report that puts all of those into context where it's just about staffing needs, short and long term, uh, is very much under development. And you can expect to see a uh, briefing by myself and Ms. Radway on that uh, in, in the months ahead. Um, um, you've added, uh, there was a goal uh, about uh, promoting and creating additional opportunities for affordable housing uh, in our community. Um, the key uh, uh, action step over the first half of the fiscal year is the development of a housing production plan. We have a draft report that has been reviewed on a preliminary basis with our Housing and Sheltering Committee and staff. And you'll ex you can expect to see those specific recommendations talked about more and have how they translate into uh, action steps uh, again in the, in the months ahead. Um, and then another goal about addressing neighborhood health, safety, and quality of life issues. Uh, broken record, safe and healthy neighborhoods initiative, safe and healthy neighborhoods work group. We have a very actively engaged uh, group representing uh, a wide spectrum of uh, perspectives. Uh, their third such meeting is tomorrow, uh, and they're hard at work uh, w expecting the development of very specific recommendations for possible action at the Springtown meeting uh, to me. Uh, no later than March 1st. I know tomorrow's meeting is a focus on uh, rental registration issues and processes and formats and all those kinds of things. And again, looking at any number of examples. Uh, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll note again that this uh, this memo is in our web packet. And um, Mr. Musandi just did sort of a, a quick summary of some key points. So it's much more <coughs> detailed if folks want to read that. And I, um, I'll remind us that uh, among the reasons we do this are to make sure that we're kind of on track with everything, but also to give him feedback in case we think that uh, you know, he's misunderstanding the intent of the goal or, or anything <coughs> like that. So this is our opportunity to try and say, wait a minute, you know, we're, we're not on the same page. Um, so if that were to happen, this is when it would be. Um, and I will also just point out one thing that you did not mention, that, but I think is really critically important to mention um, under goal number two with the uh, this, the improving the relationship or whatever it says with the university and colleges, et cetera, is uh, at the very end of that paragraph, uh, he notes that he's pursuing ways the colleges can oh, yeah. partner with the Thank town you. to reduce demand for ambulance services. You know, this has been a very, very serious issue in town for a while, a growing issue, and um, I just want to make sure he gets due uh, credit for uh, <laughs> uh, uh, all of the efforts he is putting in with different levels of the uh, university administration um, through our fire department, our fire chief, to try and um, to try and deal with that. So that's a money-saving situation. It's a it's a health and safety situation for the town and for mm. for students. And so that's really critical. So I just wanted to highlight that. Questions and comments from select board, Ms. Brewer. Yeah, I was going to say, he, he skipped whole paragraphs, so there's lots more you can read <laughs> online. Um, and it's really dense, too. It's not all bullet points. We are conserving trees. I want you to know this. Um, I wanted to compliment him on item number seven with the phrase, much more remains to be done before I submit a detailed report. Thank you for that. Perfect. I like that very much. <laughs> I feel so much better now. And I was thinking about you, actually, I when I wrote that I sentence. Thought maybe you were. <laughs> I thought maybe you were. Um, and so moving back to safe and healthy neighborhoods, safe and healthy neighborhoods, um, let's look at 1D. 
because that mentions the March 1 date, and you just mentioned the March 1 date. Yeah. So the idea is these guys keep meeting and meeting and meeting, and they've already had three meetings in like two weeks. <laughs> um, it's like crazy. And the idea is they get you recommendations by March 1st. Then what happens between March 1st and town meeting, and when, when does the public really, I mean, obviously they can follow the process, they can come to meetings, but when they're ready to like, I have a thing to react to that's kind of a big context document rather than here's some individual pieces that are going to happen at town meeting. How do you per perceive that, Mike? Sure. Um, it's an ongoing process that has a public component um, uh, starting with basic information sharing with the wider community, primarily through the web page. Uh, we have a home page for the Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods Initiative and Work Group if you go to the home page of the town website, amherstma.gov, and click on uh, living on the home screen, uh, you'll see an, uh, uh, you can then click on safe and healthy neighborhoods. Um, so the best practices from other communities, the charge of the committee, meeting minutes, past meeting minutes, future agendas, the rough calendar of what's happening when, I know there are at least a couple of public, uh, not public hearings, but workshops, if you will, where public meetings, yeah, public to, meetings that will be getting dra um, that will be completely devoted to right. getting feedback from the public on the drafts as they exist to date. Those will be in the evenings on January twenty second and February nineteenth. And so I think you know regularly at at, at select board meetings uh, through myself and and. Uh, committee members and uh, work group members, but uh, primarily through the chair, uh, Dave Zomek, uh, up updating as appropriate. Um, so I don't expect this big vacuum of, you know, m no information and then March 1 is when light is shined. It's supposed to be an iterative, continuous uh, public process. And if I could just add, uh, after that, then it becomes an item for the town meeting warrant and goes through all the same processes that all the right. all the warrant articles go through. Sure, but right, I wanted to know the in between part. Yeah, right. So thank you. Other questions or comments, Ms. Stein and Mr. Heaton. I hate to be a grump, <laughs> <laughs> um, but for number eleven, I really think you need a little bit more about the the um, first sentence uh, and rather than jumping straight to the roads um, I, I think that the people who brought this goal forward um, really were talking much more about the nuisance the disruptions the um, attacks on their property uh, all kinds of issues beyond the roads. I mean, we hear about the roads. I'm not saying the roads aren't important, but I just think it's disproportionate, the uh, first sentence with the amount of space devoted to roads in number 11. Uh, understood, I was just, again. I know. Because it, it was a detailed answer on number two, but yeah. I understand what you mean. Yeah. Uh, and Ms. Reed. Yeah, I just want to maybe pull back a little bit to the general. Um, I, I wanted to, to, to observe that there's nothing here which is a surprise. Um, this is all stuff that we've talked about, the stuff that we've heard about. Uh, we've been really kept abreast of all of this. Um, I, I know, I, I, which is not to say that I don't appreciate this because it does help nucleate our discussions and you know individual items that we can begin to, to fine tune. Other questions or comments? Ms. Stein. Um, just to add on to what Aaron said, it's important that this be out there sure. for others to understand, even if we're aware of it, <coughs> yeah. um, that the specifics of how the town manager is evaluated and self-evaluates are critical for people out there to get. Absolutely, <coughs> and uh, just kind of building on Mr. Hayden's point also, you know, the, the, all the things that we do, um, 
all of us do week to week and month to month really fall under the umbrella of these performance goals. And so it's a good check-in to just make sure that the kinds of things that we're talking about on an ongoing basis are in fact the same things that we have set for goals. You know, that there, there's not some distraction that's taking his attention and the town's attention off into a new direction. Um, and if there is, do we need to do we need to address that and update the goals appropriately? Um, but it, it just it's kind of making sure that that every Everything is on the right path, so I think it is a really valuable check-in, and uh, and the detailed information is very important so, for all audiences. Anything else on this? All right, next, Great. Mr. Musanti. Uh, next uh, was an update on <coughs> here we go again, safe and healthy neighborhoods initiative update. Uh, in in the summary I did just give you, uh, we talked about the meeting agenda for tomorrow uh, for the work group focusing on uh, rental registration. Uh, there's some specific examples from other communities and should be, a, should be another good uh, productive discussion. Um, so the, the other thing about Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods <coughs> isn't, is it isn't just the work group, it's, it's what the staff is doing internally and yeah. so um, that included in our packet, Ms. Musanti yes. gave us uh, the updated report from Rob Mora, the building commissioner, about the status of um, dis, uh, complaints and violations that are being followed up on. That is on the Safe and Healthy Work Group, uh, or Safe and Healthy yes. web page, and is updated twice a month. He's trying to do that on the 15th and the, and the end of each month, so that's a really good way for folks to be tracking. It, mm -hmm. it, doesn't, have, it doesn't have, you know, micro information about stuff, but it does present a picture of the kind of volume that's being dealt with in that department and the kind of follow-up that's happening. Um, so there, are there any other staff things, uh, not related to the working group, but, but related to just the staff's approach to dealing with these issues? Uh, no, other than to just reinforce, and you heard that back in September when they were all here, uh, they're fully engaged on this. And so I know in inspection services uh, report, there's over 90, uh, 90 issues that are have either been followed up to resolution or in progress to some account. And, just having all those listed uh, is very, very helpful. And uh, um, so the staff's all over this. Ms. Brewer. Uh, two things. One is I was just double checking that I could find the Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods page again. And if we could put the, um, when I say we, of course, I mean everyone who isn't me. Um, <laughs> someone could put in the uh, those two feedback sessions on the town calendar as soon as possible. Oh, yeah, yeah. That'd be awesome. It's one of those things where we don't have to worry so much about the agenda being perfect because it's not that. It's more of a save the date calendar thing when people hunt for it. My other question was in regards to this document, which um, I may have been distracted by my computer when I was uh, looking at this. Um, this is in our packet. The reason we don't put the specific street address is for privacy concerns? Yes. Okay. Double and this is, as I understand it, a precursor to a more robust um, complaint tracking system. That That's yeah. exactly right. Uh, this is a uh, time consuming but necessary you know, giant Excel spreadsheet exercise for translating into reports. So we're looking at something that's linked with our permit tracking software. So it's all housed in one, you know, parcel-driven database. And so uh, planning, inspections, health, fire, IT are all engaged on that effort to make that happen. And while the, the exact addresses of properties aren't listed on that spreadsheet, if one is <coughs> the neighbor who's complaining about a particular violation at a particular property, once we get this complaint tracking system, that person would be able to follow the exact yes. status of that complaint. Mr. Eden. So, a technical question: Is this a, a, a module in uh, the Munis? No, that's a that's a spreadsheet. So, I mean, that was with the Munis permitting modules and and that is the goal, modules. and that's the uh, vetting of how that might be structured. Right, best. Yep. I'll just note that um, through all of this process, I've. Uh, I've gotten to uh, deal with and talk to Mr. Mora much mm -hmm. more than I ever uh, had the opportunity to do before, and it's been really fascinating to me just 
how complicated, as if you wouldn't know, right, how complicated this job is. But um, it, it, his ability to get into a property to pursue a complaint is so restricted appropriately um, by state law um, that it, and the burden for proof, whatever it would take to actually, you know, you have an allegation, you say, you know, geez, you know, clearly 10 kids are living here. Well, how do you prove that 10 kids are living here? That's actually incredibly difficult to do. So uh, a great deal of his time is spent building a case. It, it, everything is an investigation and he has to get enough um, evidence that he feels is a sufficient burden of proof to prove that allegation. But it's not like you just walk in and you say, oh, clearly there are, there are eight kids here or you know, there are six cars in the driveway or whatever. It's much more complicated than that. So it's really been a fascinating learning experience for me. And uh, I was saying to him the other day, I hope he has the opportunity and takes the opportunity um, as often as possible to be talking about just how complicated that is on his end. Because I don't think that people realize um, how, how tied his hands are by state law and, and other laws. So it, it's pretty, pretty interesting stuff. Okay, other questions or comments from Mr. Musanti about safe and healthy? Moving along. I, I put into your packet a uh, summary from the Mass Municipal Association uh, summarizing the <coughs> governor's uh, mid-year state budget cuts, uh, some of which he has executive authority to implement, some of which require uh, legislative approval. Uh, um, they're looking at a $540 million estimated shortfall in the current year budget compared to the estimates used to build the budget. Um, so he has outlined, uh, I think, somewhere around $300 million in cuts and uh, the last $200 million from the state's rainy day fund to close the gap. Uh, some of those cuts uh, affect uh, uh, school grants. Uh, I've heard from the superintendent that uh, the dollar amounts affecting uh, regional school transportation um, and uh, um, um, the special education circuit breaker monies, while there's, a, there's, there's cuts there, they're not gigantic or a very material number, uh, certainly not welcome, but not, not everything's relative, not calamitous. like several years ago with the magnitude of mid-year cuts. There is a proposed $9 million cut to unrestricted general government aid, which is the successor name for lottery and additional assistance aid, which is our uh, largest individual state aid account. Uh, that $9 million um, is a 1% cut. Uh, that would be about 71000 to the town. Um, that requires uh, legislative approval to enact. Uh, we are waiting to see. The legislature has indicated that they do not intend to debate and act on that at concept until January when the legislature reconvenes in the new session. Uh, there are a number of legislators uh, who are expressing serious misgivings about that. And so it remains to be seen uh, whether that particular cut will be enacted. Uh, but we're following that closely, and uh, uh, um, that kind of uh, segues into, okay, does this affect at all our FY14 budget planning? You know I'm finalizing a budget recommendation that I will present an overview of to you and the Finance Committee at a meeting on January 16th. Um, we think these mid-year cuts, we are certainly keeping a very close eye on that. Uh, uh, Sandy and I do not think at this point that that affects our projections going forward. Uh, the next big milestone on this is what the governor proposes for uh, state aid in his budget proposal for next year. That which, which we expect to see the last week of January. Um, so we're waiting to see. We, we think we came up with uh, conservative but realistic uh, projections for next year that are essentially level-funded state aid uh, with a very tiny 
uh, less than 1% increase in school aid. Uh, so we're very much paying attention to any inklings we may be receiving out of Boston about how the governor's proposal may be impacted by that by what they're seeing in the current year. Uh, they've had a revenue hearing in Boston uh, last week uh, uh, where various economists make their projections. They're looking at overall state revenue growth of, uh, of uh, the mid-range of the estimates is 3.9 percent, and so it remains to be seen how that translates into state aid and other priorities in the state budget. Uh, so we're watching that very carefully. Um, and then it's the legislature's turn after the governor's proposal, House, then Senate. Questions about governor's budget cuts or FY14 budget prep, Ms. Brewer? So uh, although it's only a, you know, a few thousand here, a few thousand there in, in the larger scheme of things, sure. the, um, as you mentioned, on the regional transportation reimbursement and the SPED circuit breaker both, um, obviously the schools make a plan that it'll be at, at X level of reimbursement, and then sometimes it is and often it isn't, <coughs> and it's just not, you know, outside the realm of possibility in any given year. Um, it's just to have it come down as a clear cut at this point during the year is obviously not helpful. One of the things I'm wondering is what's um, your sense of the context of that in regards to veterans benefits reimbursement? Because, you know, for school aid, for example, we always said, oh, you know, regional transportation, we get like 60, 65 percent in a good year. You know, originally the legislation, of course, was for 100 percent. Um, but it varies a bit from right. year to year. We always say 75 for veterans yes. benefits. How does this, I've never seen, I never noticed them cutting this before. And so I guess um, I The legislature that. to its credit has uh, fairly consistently uh, supported the statutory uh, funding of the state's share of veterans benefits, which is 75%. Uh, so we don't anticipate uh, that percentage slipping. Uh, I think there might have been a small cut to that line item in the governor's cuts. It was more an updated projection of what's really needed to meet the uh, statutory level as opposed to cutting the level of benefits. Um, so we'll continue to monitor that. And then we're always, uh, there's an ongoing effort with the state to uh, be able to have their systems in such a way that allows a reimbursement uh, to happen sooner than 11 months after we pay it, which has been the long standing. And uh, Steve Connor, our veterans agent, is now a, a leader of the statewide uh, veterans agent association, and he's actively working with uh, the state uh, veterans services department and others to on, the, on this whole processing side, which is another longer term thing. Other questions or comments? Did you want to talk more about the FY14 budget prep? Um, more than you've said already, or you want uh, questions no, on that? I think okay. Do you want to give the select board the update on uh, having met with DHCD? Oh, uh, uh, I did meet with uh, Department of Housing and Community Development, uh, key personnel related to our uh, Community Development Block Grant funding status for the next uh, f uh, federal fiscal year, which begins October 1, 2013, for which we've already started our planning. Uh, our, our status uh, for grant funding was uh, uh, changed with their review of our uh, updated uh, demographic information where we were no longer considered a mini entitlement community, uh, which has allowed us to receive 900000 uh, per year uh, for social services, non-social services, as well as administrative support. Uh, we had a very uh, good uh, discussion with them about the, the uh, reasons for that, uh, and we've received, uh, I received very positive uh, feedback from uh, the state folks about um, um, us receiving a minimum of 450000 uh, in CDBG funding uh, for next year. Uh, they've also encouraged us <coughs> Uh, to apply for what's considered the competitive grant, um, which was, this is probably the, the, the key piece of information uh, uh, that I learned at this meeting. Uh, we thought it was an all or nothing thing where 
we may be in eligible for this one-time transition funding of no more than 450000 or uh, roll the dice, apply for the competitive grant in a much more difficult competitive uh, field and maybe get some portion of as much as ni of 900000 What We receive very positive uh, indicators that even if we were to apply for the competitive round for up to 900000 uh, that uh, there was a very strong likelihood that we would receive a minimum of 450000 So it's kind of like we're in this situation where uh, we, we we're, lo we're actively now following up and exploring with them what's really needed to have a competitive grant in a competitive grant cycle given the, the, the late calendar and given the uh, different criteria there because there is more uh, legwork that's needed uh, to do that. Um, I was reassured that that would not put at risk unless we totally botch it. And I say that in all professional seriousness, uh, we have, and it was acknowledged by the state, we have a very well administered uh, CDBG grant locally with all the appropriate contractual safeguards and documentation and all that kind of stuff. So, so having that good baseline puts us in a, in a very good position. So um, I guess the main takeaway is uh, there's a chance we could receive more than 450 uh, all the way up to the 900 and we're we are actively looking at now uh, before finalizing whether to apply for that whole amount uh, by February 15th, which is another challenge. Um, but strongly leaning in that direction. And we wouldn't learn uh, for sure the outcome of those applications until uh, uh, the June timeframe for implementation this fall. So it's, it's not as good as just continuing to be a mini entitlement, but it's not as certainly not zero, and it's uh, there. There is a possibility, even though it's a, it's, you know, uh, the a odds are are steep uh, that we could receive more than 450 in the coming year. Thank you, Ms. Stein. What would it take for us to get back to being a mini entitlement? Um, I the, mean, we were just a hair uh, over. Uh, we're a hair, yeah, we're a hair under, yeah. Um, and we've hovered from a hair over to a hair under okay. in these last many years. Um, the state has committed to a review of the criteria really over the next year or so, and we intend very much to be part of that conversation, and uh, we've, we've shared with them some specific thoughts we have about methodology and those kinds of things and so they're they're actively listening at this point and, and you know i think that's to their credit mr Hayden. who who's um who's putting the, together that the, the grant request the application well we have the benefit now of uh, uh our cdbg advisory committee and working with uh, uh, nate malloy primarily uh, in our planning office uh, we have the social service uh, project applications in hand and so we've been using the HUD and DHCD recommended criteria to evaluate those so those are in very good shape it's tougher on the non-social service portion of the uh, of the grant there's additional hoops to jump through so um, I have Nate in particular uh, following up with the state in which uh, we asked for and they committed to providing uh, some technical assistance so we fully understand the different hoops. Uh, and so that's, that's happening in earnest right now. And um, I'll be meeting with the CDBG Advisory Committee as well to give the lay of the land and action, action steps. Other questions and comments on this? Okay, that brings us to, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Brooke. Uh, just uh, another, you know, because of going to CDBG, just to ask the town manager to say now what I'm going to say, which is that he had double-checked and made sure that there, even with the transition funding or with the competitive <coughs> funding, we could not change the percentages oh, yes. as I, they're normally I laid I did out, ask that so explicitly and was told unequivocally uh, <laughs> This is a HUD federal guideline. We have, we and the state have no 
flexibility, even in a so-called transition year, to amend our percentage allocations. So uh, the, the social service agencies are 20% of whatever the award is. Uh, that's, that's kind of the, the one that most people uh, are thinking about. So that was good to know. And we can spend all of our time about putting together the strongest possible applications versus you know speculating and uh, about allocating a, a higher percentage. Uh, and so uh, their hands are basically tied on that, and we had a good discussion about it. Thank you. Thank <coughs> you for bringing that up, Ms. Brewer. Okay, anaerobic digestion. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, yes. Just when you thought it was safe. <laughs> uh, this is actually a very exciting initiative of the Mass uh, Department of Environmental Protection, uh, looking to uh, reduce the amount of uh, uh, organic material, uh, uh, food waste and yard waste that goes into our landfills across the state each year. It's uh, uh, greater than 25% of the total, which is a huge percentage. And so in terms of extending the life of landfills or uh, just being sounder environmentally, there's a number of initiatives, one of which is anaerobic digestion, which is uh, a practice that has been used very successfully, uh, uh, mostly in Europe and especially in Germany, to reduce the uh, amount of solid waste from organic material. Um, and so the DEP has launched an initiative to site up to three facilities in Massachusetts over the next couple of years. And they've identified a potential site uh, on state-owned land, uh, which is actually university-controlled land uh, in Hadley, um, immediately adjacent to our wastewater treatment plant off of Mullen Center Way uh, between the treatment plant and Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, there's an empty uh, area there. They're thinking of that being a viable spot uh, because there's organic waste and sludge are key ingredients uh, to a uh, waste to energy facility such as an anaerobic digestion facility. So proximity to uh, institutional organic waste generators such as a university and next to a sludge producing entity which is one of the byproducts of our treatment process, makes it a uh, potentially very viable site. Uh, we have, we're very much interested in it. We've had preliminary discussions with the Mass DP University uh, uh, leadership uh, and the state. Uh, there was a community meeting in Hadley. Uh, last week, the DEP came out. There were Hatfield community leaders, and I know Stephanie was there uh, with some other staff. Uh, representing Amherst uh, with myself. Uh, so there's a feasibility study period that will be underway in the first part of 2013. We're actively engaged on that effort, uh, and the DEP has committed to us to look at, help us ex examine uh, what uh, issues does such a facility have on our wastewater treatment process itself, because there'd be uh, uh, the material that comes into our wastewater plant from such a facility would change the, you know, the mix of our uh, uh, collection system, if you will, and that has treatment implications. We want to fully understand them and understand what, if any, cost impli implications there are, and the state has pledged to explore that with us. Uh, there may be some grant funding to help us do such a feasibility. Uh, and so there's been good dialogue so far. Uh, our DPW's uh, directly engaged on this with the DEP, and uh, I think there was support for proceeding with the feasibility stage. Uh, I think the state has a goal of having a facility operational sometime in 2014 after a competitive bid process, assuming a feasibility study, you know, is successful. And I'll just add a little bit to that, um, that uh, it was a really interesting meeting and um, I got to talk to a bunch of people who know a lot more about something like this than I do, which is practically everybody, um, but, but people who really have a lot of experience in this kind of thing. And, uh, I, and they were telling me that really this is, from a conceptual standpoint, this is all good. This is an alternative energy 
um, source that is just a, a win-win. It, as Mr. Musanti said, it, it dramatically reduces the amount of waste that goes into landfills, um, and it turns it into alternative energy. So it, it's it's a very very viable and um, and robust technology that, uh, as he said, is is well used in Europe. Um, the <laughs> The main concerns people have about it are the kinds of concerns that they have about everything. Traffic, how does it change the traffic situation? Um, aesthetics, you know, what does it look like? How ugly is it? You know, is it gonna, is it gonna be a blight on the landscape? Um, smell, does it produce any terrible odor or anything like that? Um, those, are the, those are the primary concerns. Um, I encourage you to, to go through those PowerPoints. The meeting was just basically those PowerPoints. Um, what they're, what they want to do now is make sure that the feasibility study addresses all those kinds of questions. So whatever kinds of questions we have about it, the folks from Hadley have about it, folks from UMass, all the kind of um, potentially impacted stakeholders have, they want to make sure that that question gets included so that it gets studied in the feasibility study. So anything that you think of when you go through those slides, um, send to Mr. Musanti because he has all the contact information for the, the guy from DEP who's going to be doing all of this. Ms. Stein. Um, I thought it was very reassuring that there already are six wastewater treatment plants that use anaerobic um, digestion uh, in Massachusetts. Right. Okay, so it's not like just Germany. But I did have a question. Um, they talk about the UMass site as being, the UMass Dammer site being a, a good potential site because there's feedstock of 1,990 tons per year of organics on site. And that, I didn't have a good image of what the organics are that are on site. I can understand collections of organic material from local schools, the colleges, uh, local producers, um, supermarkets, but what's on site that is that much? Aaron knows. Sludge. No, he talks about sludge as the <laughs> second. Well, okay, um, if you add the two together, I guess that's where the, I get it, okay. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, there's a lot of sludge, which is not <laughs> UMass produced, okay. at least not directly. <laughs> okay, all right, if, if, if the um, organics from the colleges are considered local or on-site, then I guess the sludge makes, that's where it comes from, the two of them together. Mr. Hayden. So one of the questions I'm going to ask is, is whether or not the combined heat and power plant will be part of it, because the, uh, the cogen plant at UMass now can't use this gas directly. Uh, that's part of the feasibility study phase is how it, how it best interacts with our treatment plan as well as the cogen operations on campus. Mr. Reed. And another question, can we help make sure that it happens? <coughs> this is very exciting, a very exciting thing. It, it's, it's, there are many benefits to it. I would say questions, you know, troubleshoot any of yeah. the, the kinds of concepts that the community might have that, that, that would stand in the way of this. And we actually, at the end of the day, don't know if um, the state needs anybody's permission to do this whatsoever. But they do want to, they do want to be good partners in this going forward. I was forward. thinking of encouragement, not, not so much right. permission, but encouragement. Yeah, but, I, you know, I think that like so much we experience and so much that we do here, um, there is community concern about what if. So, you know, if you can be sort of wearing your community hat and be getting in those what ifs so that they are all um, proven and reassured through the feasibility right. study, that would really smooth the process. You got it. And yeah, please funnel those through me. Uh, and, this, and the DEP has been clear, and this last community meeting was one example of that, of wanting to get all of those, any of those issues, types of issues vetted and answered during the uh, feasibility phase. Ms. Reed. I, I just, just uh, full disclosure, I grew up <coughs> next to one of these plants, which mm. it itself was on the other side of it, was next to some of the most expensive real estate in the country. And it was a great facility, so, uh, and there were no problems with it. Good to know. Ms. Stein. I'm still having trouble with the way that's phrased when <laughs> it's, because it says plus organics from nearby colleges and local producers, plus possible use 
of on-site wastewater treatment sludge. So I still go back to the way it's phrased make me, makes me think there's another 1,990 tons there, and I, that I just don't get. Yeah. You, you agree? Yeah, I see. I know there's an answer to that. I just don't know okay. what it is. All right. And That's that will fine. be spelled out much more specifically mm -hmm. also in a feasibility okay. study okay. of why, why this site works or doesn't work. Right. I mean, I could understand if they didn't, you know, have this plus. I, I will also add, I know from the university's perspective, and they were uh, expressing this at the community meeting and, and the meeting we had on campus with the chancellor, uh, there's a research component to this that is also attractive to the university. I'm all for it, <clears throat> but I just yeah. would like to understand it <laughs> completely. Anything else about anaerobic digestion? <laughs> so by all means, yeah, get, those, <laughs> right, get those questions in a, as soon as you can because the feasibility study is going to be happening. It will probably start after the first of the year. Is that yes. true? So time is of the essence. Okay, next up, what do we have? Solar. Uh, solar, uh, uh, the old landfill project, uh, neighborhood meetings. Uh, we're expecting, we're identifying dates uh, in the month of January to have those meetings happen. Hallelujah. Uh, um, we've also been working with uh, the uh, uh, developers on this ongoing effort to uh, specify how uh, the footprint uh, would be, you know, made smaller so that there's less of a, of a visual and other impact. And so that those uh, those uh, revisions would be a fundamental part of those uh, uh, meetings uh, after the first of the year. Uh, we're also in communication uh, with a prospective uh, development in North Amherst, uh, which is a precursor to uh, a permit application that <coughs> would likely be submitted during the first quarter of 2013. And uh, we're also continuing to receive uh, updates about prospective solar array developments in nearby communities that we may have an interest in also in terms of purchasing a portion of our uh, electricity from uh, that renewable source out of town, again, which would also help us meet our needs while reducing the footprint of the solar array that I recommended in uh, at the old landfill. Ms. Stein. I'm going to ask the question that I'm sure all the listeners at home want to know the answer to. Is this still in court? Uh, the, the lawsuit is still considered active. Uh, there's no real uh, uh, action going on. Uh, uh, you know, there have been multiple amendments to the original complaint, uh, but none, none relatively recently. Anything else on solar? Okay, anything on recent and upcoming activity? Uh, I just wanted to highlight quickly the, uh, I mentioned the land grant for the Ritchie property. We did host the uh, uh, Department of uh, uh, Environmental and Energy, Energy and Environmental uh, Resources. Uh, uh, Secretary Rick Sullivan and his team were here in this room uh, on December 5th announcing grants to uh, communities in this part of the state and uh, we were one of the larger grants uh, for the Ritchie property and that's very exciting and uh, uh, Jim Ritchie was also here that day. It was nice to talk with him and uh, uh, myself and Dave Zomek and others thanked him and thanked he and his family for their patience as this deal was developed over a very long period of time. Uh, so we're excited about that. I also wanted to mention that uh, that portal sculpture that you've been enjoying for several years now in Kendrick Park. Uh, we have reached a, an agreement uh, with the artist that will allow that uh, sculpture to stay uh, on a permanent basis. Uh, there is an acquisition price. I'm pleased to report that uh, all of those funds will be from non-town uh, funds uh, mostly private uh, fundraising. Uh, there is a small cultural council grant 
that will fund a portion of it. Uh, and the uh, Amherst Business Improvement District has pledged uh, uh, 3500 uh, toward this uh, purchase, which would be the last uh, 3500 of the 10000 needed. Um, so excited to see that. And uh, uh, the conversation about other art in the downtown or public spaces is a long-term one. There's clearly public art is one of the uh, uses identified for the future of Kendrick Park. Uh, and so I was comfortable uh, moving forward on the sculpture, but there's a lot more conversation with Public Arts Commission and others before we, we uh, think about other, other locations there and elsewhere. Any other questions or comments from Mr. Musanti? <coughs> okay, thank you very much. Next, we have member reports, liaison and representative reports. And before we start with that, I would um, just note that I was having a conversation with a resident recently, and um, they were suggesting that we once again do what you folks did a while ago and have done intermittently, um, which is publicize the openings. Uh, on the vacancies on different committees, um, not just the ones that exist currently, but also um, as we get closer to the ones that are expiring at the end of the year that, um, believe it or not, not everyone pays as much attention to this <laughs> stuff as we do. So, uh, so the idea of kind of looking through committee by committee on the website was not very attractive and didn't seem user friendly to this person. And so uh, I, I mentioned that this has happened before. And so that was good feedback to know that people find that helpful. So I'll just offer that to you. And I also mentioned to this person, and we should mention here publicly, that um, folks should fill out CAFs all the time. Just having them in the pipeline um, that's a citizen activity form and it's available on the town website. Having them in the pipeline is very important. Ha uh, vacancies come up unexpectedly even on committees that are full. So uh, we're always looking to fill those vacancies, but people shouldn't wait until you know a specific time of the year to get those in or whatever. So Ms. Brewer. Um, I will at some point talk in with Diana and, and the select board off to the town manager office really about these exact issues but we were in fact one we wished we had done it during town meeting but we mm. realized that staff since it's all the same staff was too busy with town meeting to help us sort this because sometimes it's you know just making sure that that list is the most up to date you know is not the highest priority thing in the world in comparison to getting something done for town meeting that night so um as as good as our lists are now they're not quite always 100 percent to the moment updated and um, perhaps as we move forward with that, that we will be able to find a space where like on the CAF page or something, we could have a little thing that says current openings that would be easy to update, you know, mm -hmm. kind of thing that people could go and look for too. But like you say, the important thing is for people to continually apply, um, whether they think mm -hmm. there's an opening or not. But yes, I will, I've made a note here that we will follow up with Deborah to get those updates. Right. And, and I will add that unfortunately not um, the town website is not always um, up to the minute on showing where there are vacancies on a given board or committee or commission. So um, we can usually get that from the town manager's office, but we need to do it again. Yeah. All right, so liaison reports from folks. Ms. Stein. Okay, I uh, was at that wonderful awarding of the land grants and got to shake Mr. Ritchie's hand, which was nice to be able to put a human being behind that property. On December 6th, um, CPA uh, committee met and discussed the propos proposals that have been submitted and the available funds. Unfortunately, there was almost one and a half million dollar requests and only about um, $361,483 approximately to, uh, to spend, which means we can only fund about one in four. And um, that's partially because even though there's about half a million dollars, some of it is already pledged for debt service on for very worthwhile projects from past years. So um, we're going to have to, de they're going to have to deny, unfortunately, three out of four, which is sad. 
Um, let's see, December 7th was the staff party, which was lovely. And December 11th uh, was Ag Commission, and I mentioned the winter market. Um, the folks are meeting uh, with the downtown summer farmers market folks. They've met at least once um, and are trying to work out um, how to incorporate more Amherst farmers into the downtown market. But the problems are large because you don't want the market to be so big downtown that it's diminishes the profit of the people who have been long timers. So it's, it's a difficult situation. Ellen Story's aide was at the meeting, which was interesting, um, because she, through her economic initiatives, is interested in promoting agriculture. So it was a very worthwhile discussion, and they're going to try to get more transparency into the process to to get the summer common market, the one downtown, to um, formalize their rules, and they're trying to get the Ag Commission to state very clearly what the goals and, and best objectives would be for moving forward. Um, they did have a question, actually, about that. Um, the permit comes to us, and we approve it. Is that correct? We approve their use of the lot of the Spring of the Street lot. parking lot. As a, yes. Okay. All right, and that's in March. Usually comes to us in March. Yep. Okay. Thank you. They, they start up in April, so sometimes it's late February. Sometimes okay. it's by late March. Okay. And that's all I have to report on. Okay. Anyone else, Mr. Eden? Yeah, a couple of things. This, this uh, last couple of weeks, um, for me, have been a lesson in the, uh, the interconnectedness between um, efforts of various different committees in town. Um, as an example, the Public Shade Tree Committee is uh, asking for a, an intern to help them do uh, two things. One is promote their first Saturday tree plantings, but also to um, um, uh, provide the muscle and the effort to uh, put together the public shade tree bylaw. Um, the, uh, the interconnectedness being that uh, right now it, it's imagined that it would involve not just the public shade tree committee figuring out how to do that, but a whole bunch of other committees to work on that. Um, the uh, recycling and refuse management committee, similar. Um, I guess Sue was at the, at the sludge thing. I think is that, that was the nickname for it. Um, and um, that's interesting because it, it may or will be a component in their zero waste uh, proposal. Um, right now what they're working on is uh, bringing forward a, a request um, a pro uh, to create a process for developing the zero waste policy um, in Amherst. And not quite sure what the request will be and of whom but um, they're going to be working on that. Um, the hope, again, is to get across um, you know, elements of the community so that it's a robust and, and supportable, implementable policy when the time comes finally, sort of looking into the future of when there are no more holes to throw garbage into. Um, public Works, um, the Public Works Committee is um, uh, sort of reheating the, um, the traffic calming plan. I guess that got shelved a number of years ago, not that long ago, and um, there have been a number of requests for um, ad basically ad hoc traffic calming uh, implementation here and there, and it became incumbent on them that, oh, you know, we really should have a policy to, to begin to organize our, our thinking about this. So they'll be warming that up. And the Public Transportation and Bicycle Committee um, are, um, is thinking about um, making a recommendation for bicycle shelters um, in town. Um, there have been a number of requests for them. I know of two anyway. Um, but it turns out that that's also kind of an interesting issue. So they're going to be um, putting together a recommendation for us on that. Um, so stay tuned. Also, um, the Public Transportation Bicycle Committee are working on um, um, sort of following up on town meetings 
approval of the northward extension of the bike trail of the Arthur Swift uh, rail trail um, northward through UMass. Um, they're trying to, to make sure that, that that is in fact has moved off of top dead center and um, that that work is continued. It, that, that folds in with the, the CPA money because a large portion of that funding was approved through the CPA process. So um, that's what was going on the last couple of weeks. Great, thank you. Any questions or comments for Mr. Hayden? All right, anyone else please on reports? Ms. Brewer. <coughs> No. Mr. Wald was desperate to go, <laughs> but I went ahead and stole it. Um, Leisure Services and Supplemental Education Commission is meeting this week, and I don't have any recollection what's on the agenda, so I can just tell people to go and look at the website. Um, and Housing and Sheltering Committee is planning to look at the draft of the Housing Production Plan again. You'll be doing that on Wednesday morning at 9, and also, of course, on the website. And as soon as they find a date, the CDBG advisory group will be meeting again. They were originally intending to meet last week, but weren't able to, and um, working at looking at having some sort of public hearing associated with the new application process we just outlined. So again, just watch on the website for all those things if you are interested in those particular topics. And I, re, Regional School District Planning Group, um, for those of you who, when we saw the stuff about the governor's mid-year budget cuts, um, there, was, there were cuts to the areas of the grants that the Regional School District Planning Board is applying for. And we thought, oh, great, we finally get to this process. At this point in the process, we're putting these great grants, and now they're going away. And although those line items were decreased, we believe that we will still be able to, they, they, the program still exists. Um, the first one, uh, we've been asked to decrease our budget by a third, which is not very pleasant, but we may still, well, we will end up with a grant when all is said and done. With the first one, um, in more like 60000 instead of 90000 mm -hmm. And the CIC grants, it's way too soon to tell exactly how that's going to play out, but well over 100 applications were received, and that's the one where we're competing with all kinds of other things all over the state. Not, But we are one of the few groups that are looking at regionalization of education this particular year at this particular moment in time. And so we are hopeful that that will come true, but again, it will be probably at least February, possibly even March, till we hear an answer on that. So things are perking along. Please um, have in your calendars, one, you already have the Four Towns meeting associated uh, with January 19th. 19th? Oh, you said Martin Luther King. 12th, Martin Luther King. Right, it's King not the 19th, it's the 12th. 12th. And, right, because the 19th is the Martin Luther King breakfast. Right. But the 12th, we'll have a section about regionalization. And then there is to be, although we don't have 100% confirmation, we believe that we will be having a meeting on Saturday, February 2nd, which we will in be inviting all four towns to hear directly to from two consultants that we have hired, so that it's not just what committee members are reporting back to them, but directly from the consultants themselves on February 2nd. And so we finally came up with that day, and we were so excited, and somebody said, well, what about a snow day? And I'm like, look, <laughs> there's only so many things we can oh. do here. So we'll work on that, but watch for that. We'll try and get that as a save the date in the calendar as well. Great, thank you. Questions or comments from Ms. Brewer? All right, Mr. Wald. Yeah, it's miscellaneous things. The Design Review Board continues to do its good work on various <laughs> run-of-the-mill projects, no big controversies. Uh, there is some controversy in the Historical Commission. Uh, there is, you recall that demolition of a barn on Lincoln Avenue took place, and the Commission had declined to uh, impose a delay or even hold a hearing on that, and some residents are challenging that, uh, trying to appeal that process, which to my mind has never been done before. So that's working its way through the system, the meeting about that this week. Uh, Historical Commission made its own list of rankings for CPA projects, as Ms. Stein has seen in the sort of raw form. Um, also be hearing, I assume, in the near future from residents around the university who are interested in creating a local historic district along the lines of the one that's been proposed for study in North Amherst. So that seems to be a, this year's popular trend. Uh, those are the main things there. Um, Mr. Musanti mentioned a lot, of, of course, about public arts these days. The, the larger takeaway was that they're very pleased with the efforts of the biennial and think it was a great success. And if anything, maybe you should do more to publicize it. So it's not just sort of the opening nights, but the all the all 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 day round thing for the whole month. Uh, again, they're very pleased that the portal has now been given a safe home. Uh, 
the missing bunny does not have one. <laughs> we don't, that was, our, I don't make, mean to make light of it, but that was one of the, the another incidents of tragic and stupid vandalism where a project that was created for the biennial was stolen by a person or persons unknown and not yet returned. But it may show up, we don't know. And then of course in January, Ms. Stein and I start up with JCPC in the budget process. All right, thank you. Uh, I don't have any liaison reports. We've talked enough about safe and healthy stuff. I had a bunch of Camp of the Community Coalition stuff going on this week. <coughs> um, anything else? I've either missed their meeting or I don't have anything to talk about. Mr. Hayden. I, um, I learned a long time ago, but didn't write down, that I've really got to write down things that I need to say. So any event, I left one off. The, uh, I wanted to make an announcement from, for the uh, Town Meeting Coordinating Committee that they would they are urging us to attend two uh, uh, meetings this week, tomorrow and Wednesday, on zoning. Um, tomorrow, of course, it's the, uh, the Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods meeting, but on Wednesday, it's the Zoning Subcommittee, the Planning Board are meeting at five o'clock to discuss um, uh, zoning issues, particularly around uh, rentals, student rentals, uh, rentals. Uh, right, what they're doing is they're holding their, bi uh, what do we call it, semi-annual semi zoning forum. Right. So that's where they're going to determine their zoning priorities going forward. So folks who want to get something into their hopper and pipeline really should uh, should make sure that they are there for that. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wobbs. Since we got our names mixed up, we're both, both <laughs> forgetting things. Uh, one, just one other thing that's related to that. As we know, the town meeting had approved uh, CPA money for the North Common project, which was dependent on getting a park grant, which we didn't get. Uh, and the state really basically, Mr. Mazzanti can correct me if I'm wrong, basically liked our process, our I mean our application and the way we do things, uh, but among other things thought it needed a larger public process. Uh, you know, you write, you write the grants on the schedule and you get what you can, but there hasn't been a full round of conversations about that space and how to use it. So uh, as part of the possible reapplication, there will be some kind of a public process involving historical commission and leisure services. And I believe the 24th of January is the first proposed date. I'm not sure it's firmed up yet. But just as long as we're talking about January calendar dates, that'll be something where citizens can express desires about the shape of that piece of the common right outside town hall here. Thank you. Uh, that reminds me, uh, Mr. Hayden, did uh, TMCC have any feedback on the 7 o'clock start time for us? Did they get many surveys back? Or? Yes, but I don't know what it is. Okay. <laughs> when you do, you'll let us know. Oh, you'll be the second to know. The second, okay. All right. Um, so then let's now do this master plan implementation committee charge. Did you all eventually end up with a copy of this? Is it on your it's desk? On our no? desk. Yes. It was okay. also on the back of the commemoration. I didn't oh, see it. Oh, it was. Anymore. Okay. All Ooh. right. So, so let me give you some background here. Okay, <laughs> so uh, you'll recall at, at our last meeting, um, I finally, uh, about two months late, uh, gave us our FY12 Select Board Annual Report. And so in going through the notes for each meeting about the things that we did to, to write up the annual report, I found a couple of things that sort of fell through the cracks. And one of those was that on November 9th of 2011, we, it took up the master plan implementation committee charge. This was drafted um, as a recommendation to us by the planning board. Um, Mr. Wald had worked with planning board representatives to do that. Um, we had a, a very um, full discussion about the charge. Um, we talked all about how how we envision, especially among the, the three members who were uh, who previously served on the. Um, Comprehensive Planning Committee, um, what this committee was supposed to be and ultimately that this charge captured it. Um, what I did in the meantime is I've gone back uh, last week and I listened to the full discussion about that. So it's it's all very fresh in my mind now. Um, and after this, this lengthy discussion, we decided to change one element or two, you might say, of the charge that had been proposed to us. And that was, uh, as it was originally um, written, it said to um, present a report to the community at a public meeting biannually, which is to say every two years. And after our considerable discussion, we decided that really that should be annually and that it should happen at annual town meeting. Um, everything else we decided we liked about the charge that um, the general sense was this committee will 
figure its work out as it goes along. And after a year or two of its work, it might need to come back to us and have its, its charge tweaked, as we do with other committees. Um, so we had this big discussion. We said, okay, I would make those two changes that I said instead of it being uh, by annual, it would be annual instead of being in public meeting, it would specifically be at annual town meeting. And I was supposed to format it in the, in the way that we're standard formatting our charges now. And that just never happened. I don't know what happened, but that just never happened. I never did that. Um, so it has been thoroughly approved. Everything that on the select board's end w happened just the way it was supposed to happen, but my putting those finishing touches on it to get it up on the website did not happen. Um, it did not feel right to suddenly fix that and then get it up on the website as though a year had not passed. <laughs> so I wanted to bring it back to you, and, and so I put it on the uh, on the agenda as reconfirming the charge or confirming the approval of the charge, um, and and that was basically just to give me a way to talk to you about it and say sorry I missed that, um, and uh, and that's the status. Questions or comments, Ms. Brewer. It's been so long. Thank you for going back and listening to that. That's more than I was willing to do. I just went back and read the <laughs> minutes, which basically you'd written, so it worked out really nicely. Um, I would just say that now that we have the field for special municipal employee status, it brings it to our attention. We may as well uh, give this committee special municipal employee status as limited as its value is. It is better than not having it. So I believe that it should have it, and I don't think we intended I don't believe there was any discussion unless you heard differently that said, oh no, this committee doesn't get special municipal employee status. Uh, you, you went through the pieces of the formatting parts and you said special municipal employee, no, but we didn't talk about it. Right. You just said not give it to them, but I, we didn't. I, I think it probably should be yes. Okay. Any other thoughts about that, Mr. Hayden? After a very long discussion on the Conference of Planning Committee about these issues, I would agree but I'm wondering if there's a technical difficulty in that um, one of the boards that has a designated uh, assignee to this board is already not a special, it does not have special municipal employee status. By definition. And you're not supposed to mix statuses within a committee. Um, Do you have the status <laughs> Yeah, so rewinding back, we haven't had a special municipal employee status uh, uh, conversation in a long time. So it's true that the status applies to the committee, not to the individual, which doesn't make any sense at all, but such as it is. Um, so select board members, by definition, cannot be special municipal employees. Um, maybe that figured into the reasoning. What, what's your thought it on that? It certainly didn't figure into my reasoning. <laughs> no, I didn't think about that at all. I thought I was thinking more along the lines of the fact that Generally speaking, it used to be anyway, frowned upon for people to serve on even more than one committee at the state level in terms of, um, in terms of rep who were they representing for the town. You know, they were representing this part of the town or they were representing this part of the town. And of course, those things were originally written associated with em paid employees, not so much with volunteers. But it does get tangled up in volunteers. And of course, we all know of communities, when we go to these other meetings, we find out there are towns where there are five people who do all 57 jobs, and obviously they've figured out a way to do it. Um, we can say no. I mean, at this point, we don't have anybody to populate this. We haven't put it out for CAFs. No one's begging us for special municipal employee status. No one, frankly, knows what special municipal employee status really means, in most cases anyway. Anyhow, so it probably doesn't make a lot of difference, and we could leave it as no for now, and I could go either way. Uh, so I think that... Um leaving it the way we approved it a year ago and meant to put into place probably makes the most sense. I'm happy to check with town council after the holidays and say, hey, is there such thing as having a select board member on a committee that has special municipal employee status? Can the rest of the committee have it, but the select board member simply doesn't just because they don't? And, and then we could change it if we want, but that would be good information to have anyway. Mr. Hayden. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you for doing that because mm -hmm. um, I think the three of us who are on that committee understand the value um, uh, to recruitment that have it. even this, the modicum of relief that the special municipal employee status provides for the conflict of interest rules um, it is important for attracting, you know, uh, uh, qualified and important people. Okay. Yeah, I will look into that. It's a good question to have answered. For it will come up again if we don't get an answer <laughs> now. So. 
Okay. Uh, again, I apologize uh, about missing this. And uh, I, do we want to vote to reconfirm it, or we just want to all nod our heads in agreement that yes, it's reconfirmed. Now we know. I'll As get it put wish. up on the website. We'll nod our heads. We'll nod our heads. Thank okay. and, and and be appreciative. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Well, then we should probably tell the planning board we actually did it. I, since you don't know anybody on the planning board, that might be difficult. <laughs> but I'm just saying that in a in a world where we didn't all know each other as well, it would be important since they wrote us the letter in the first place. I will. Yeah, I, I might will send a to to officially the let them know we finally did it. Yay! I'll send a mea culpa email to the uh, chair of the yeah. planning board. Oh, like they'll remember. Okay. <laughs> 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 and, and the minutes drafting committee will. There will be a reference to the discussion in the minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we did that. Okay. Yeah, one other little thing. Oh, we'll, yeah. This will get mounted on the website as a committee. Yeah. 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 That, that, <laughs> that will definitely happen. Okay. So that brings us then to the chair's report because um, you don't have any open meeting law update, right? Okay, chair's report. So first thing on the chair's report is food truck regulations. Um, as I reported to you in a chair's report, a written chair's report um, a couple of weeks ago, I met with uh, the chamber of commerce director and the bid director right before town meeting about the food truck regulation situation. Um, we are trying to draft regulation. At this point, our regulations are practically non-existent. Food trucks aren't just aren't terribly anticipated, and they're not anticipated in sort of the way the reality is um, in the existing regulations. So, um, so figuring out what, what we have jurisdiction over at the local level versus what's covered by the whole hawker and peddler thing um, uh, was kind of the, the, is part of the conversation. The other part of the conversation is how to strike the right balance of determining uh, appropriate um, locations for food trucks to be um, and appropriate time limits for them to be there. So this is trying to balance the concerns that we've heard from some business members uh, as well as the public's uh, desiring to have food trucks around. So we are having a second meeting about that this week. Um, we, every, every time you sort of go down a path with any of this, it just raises a whole bunch more questions. So uh, hopefully we've gotten a lot of those questions answered so that we can come up with a draft, kind of a bullet point um, draft of what the regulations might look like. Not written in draft language or in regulation language, uh, but bullet points of these would be kind of the, the, the key areas. And get those circulated to all the stakeholders, folks in the business community, the select board, um, the food truck folks themselves, uh, enforcement folks. You know, this has to be something that is um, able to be enforced, et cetera. Um, so that meeting is going to be later this week. Uh, depending, I'm hoping we come out of that with this bulleted type list that I'm talking about. It might take an additional meeting after that. You know how these things go. I hope to get them to the select board to be discussed at a meeting, either at our first or second meeting in January. We are looking to move quickly with this, so there's not going to be some great big lag time. Um, a, an important point that was a question at our first meeting was, do we have the ability to change these regulations once the new licensing period starts? Or if we renewed the licenses for these folks, have they, do the, does their license now um, cover the regulations as they are when they got their license? So uh, town council says, no, you can change regulations at any time. However, the food truck licenses, license renewal information is all going out with a letter that says, as you know from the paper and as you know from conversations specifically with the staff in the select board town manager's office, new regulations are being considered and are expected for late winter or early spring. So all of these folks um, are, are well aware of what's going on. So, uh, so that's just to give you an update on where that is. And, uh, and like I said, I hope either at our first or second January meeting to have something ready for you to, to think about and discuss. So any questions on that? Okay. And then the other thing is, um, this is, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is our final meeting of 2012. Oh. Wow, <laughs> it's, been, it's been quite a year. It's really been quite a remarkable year in many ways. And uh, so I just wanted to take this opportunity to say some thanks to some folks, um, the town manager, obviously, um, for your excellent work, your, your excellent work with us and on behalf of the town. I think that the select board's relationship with the town manager just gets better and better. And, uh, and we really appreciate your good communication with us and, uh, and all the good that you do for Amherst. So thank you. 
um, Deborah Roussel and Debbie Gordon in the Select Board Town Manager's Office, whom we could not work without. <laughs> they do so much of our preparation work, so much of everything that comes, that, that happens after a meeting. You know, we, we do all of the stuff that they've prepared all for us, but then it all needs to be taken to the next level and they keep us prepared, organized, and informed and we are incredibly grateful for that. Um, staff, you know, there are too many staff for me to mention um, because I would leave out some, but uh, we couldn't do what, what we do without the recommendations that we get from so many staff members on so many different issues. Um, the budget stuff is obvious, um, but, th but there's so much more than that. I mean, we know we've got the quarterly budget updates. We've got the finance director, the comptroller. We've got the assessor and the treasurer. I mean, we, we have so many folks coming in here to keep us informed about so many things. DPW folks, um, conservation director, everything that happens from the planning department. We could not make the kinds of decisions that we make and the kinds of recommendations that we make without all of the homework that's being done by them um, for us and for the community. So uh, uh, just special thanks to them. Um, the committees, we've been talking about committee appreciation and all these vacancies and whatever. I mean, it, it's quite extraordinary when you think about the volunteer labor force that is working on behalf of Amherst on all of these incredibly important areas. That's just a ton of, of policy work and real implementation work on the, uh, the issues and in the areas that are most important, are defined by the community. These folks then carry out that work on, uh, on our behalf and make recommendations again to us for town meeting and, um, and for the kinds of things that fall under our jurisdiction. If we had to do the kinds of things Mr. Hayden was talking about earlier, you know, the, the policies on the traffic calming and all of this, if we had to do the homework and legwork on all of this stuff in order to uh, make a policy decision I mean that we all know that this job takes vastly more time than we have anyway. It would simply be impossible. So without the committees doing what they're doing, we just could not function. Uh, Amherst Media. We are so fortunate to have them. Uh, thank you folks in the booth there right now. Um, there is just incredible staff there and there's also incredible volunteers there. They are a really critical part of keeping uh, the community of Amherst informed so that they can participate in their local government. I mean, being able to be exposed to so many meetings, uh, either live in rebroadcast or my personal favorite, archived on the website to watch any time, uh, that's an incredible service that uh, is a real blessing to our community and something that, uh, that many communities do not enjoy. Um, so, uh, so a huge thank you to them. They end up working a lot of late nights with us and other unfortunate uh, committees, and uh, they are always just so uh, in such good spirits. They're so helpful to us. They're just wonderful. So thank you, folks at Amherst Media, and also my colleagues. It just really it's it is an honor and a privilege to work with you. This has been another another great year for us, and uh, looking forward to another uh, great year in 2013. And I just. I want you to know just really what a, what a privilege it is to work with each and every one of you. So thank you for your devotion to the town of Amherst. Ms. Stein. Well, first of all, likewise, and we are incredibly grateful to have you as our chair who take on way beyond what the rest of us do. And we very much appreciate for the fact that you keep us um, going. Um, secondly, since you mentioned Amherst Media, I sent in my membership today, <laughs> um, and I strongly urge um, all the members of our community to support Amherst Media because they do so much for our community. And lastly, I'd like to thank the staff who write the wonderful grants that allow us to live beyond our revenue. Um, we have gained so much from those grants over the years and this year too. So thank you to them especially. Thank you. Anyone else want to add anything? Mr. Hayden. I, I, I think I mentioned this, this a while ago and it's, 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 it's an interesting uh, maybe mixed media to, to use the television broadcast. Also recall that there's a fellow who sits behind me every night that we're here, was also here very late. And uh, so I appreciate the, the uh, 
the newspapers. Um, they don't always get it the way I would want it to be gotten, but I do appreciate them trying so hard every, every week. Well, thank you very much. All right, anything else? Then with that, we close the 2012 Select Board meeting schedule and look forward to meeting again uh, on January 7th right here in this room. Mr. Hayden. So do I get to move to adjourn? You get to move to adjourn. Without objection, this meeting adjourns at 8.49 p.m. Thank you very much to everyone. Happy holidays and happy new year. Thank you.